Her research interests are diverse and include critical disability studies, Ludwig van Beethoven, and Franz Liszt. She's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the French Beethoven Society, or the Association Beethoven France. Did I do okay? <laughs> the study of Beethoven's deafness and Diane's personal history led to her research in disability and music. Her collaboration with disabled musicians in the professional musical world allows her to expose new ideas on making music more accessible to a broader audience. And today, her paper is entitled Performing with a Different Body, Reimagining Music Making. Sorry about that confusion. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We're figuring out the technical issues here. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, can I just, I'm going to try it once. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes. Oh. Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, okay, so thank you for being here. I, my name is Diane Collin. I'm French. I'm a PhD student in musicology. And um, my presentation today is entitled Performing with a Different uh, Body, Reimagining Music Making. But the picture we see, the picture we see, I forgot that the microphone was here. The picture we see on this slide represents performers of the Para Orchestra. It's a British virtuoso ensemble of professional disabled and non-disabled uh, musicians whose mission is to redefine what an orchestra can be and to reinvent the orchestra of the 21st century. So let's keep in mind this mission of the Para Orchestra. And I would like to explore several aspects of uh, the world of professional music and musicians with disabilities. We will go through two frameworks I will use for this presentation. Then we will uh, talk about one specific article that I found interesting in relation to professional music and disability. And finally, I will give uh, three case studies of professional musicians I have interviewed. With the use of uh, these frameworks and with the mission of the Para Orchestra in mind, I would like to think of a possible revisit of the role of the musicians with disability in the professional musical world. So the two frameworks I want to use here is our critical disability studies and mediation theory. For those who are not familiar with the critical disability studies, uh, this field, is uh, offers a set of frameworks. It's not a single framework per se. Uh, it has long explored the, the different aspects of disability in our evolving society. It designs models of disability um, to allow a deeper consideration of the multiple facets of disability. Two of the main models are the medical and the social model of disability. And I also mentioned here the cultural model, which is uh, related to social model. The social model of disability provides uh, a framework for disabled people to challenge preconceived notions of a disability established by the medical uh, model, which analyzes disability from a strictly medical and functional point of view. The medical model will give a pathology, it will talk about bodily impairment, and the social model will talk about the way a person is viewed, is included, perceived in the society. So the first authors to propose the distinction between uh, disability and impairment with a critical lens uh, were Mike Oliver and Colin Barnes, and we see their pictures here. Uh, they were parts of the Union for Physically Impaired Against Segregation, UPIAS, uh, a disability rights activism movement founded in 1972 in the UK. And then the field of CDS, uh, Critical Disability Studies, CDS, evolved 
to propose other aspects and is still evolving today. But here I want to keep the social model of disability. Now, mediation theory is not frequently associated with disability, but I found it interesting to consider a bridge between uh, the, the framework I just mentioned and this theory. Mediation theory can be understood and analyzed in multiple ways. So I start with the definition of mediation itself. According to the, the Oxford Dictionary, mediation attempts to end a problem between two or more people or groups who disagree by, taking, uh, by talking to them and trying to find uh, things that everyone can agree on. So in other words, it is a structured process in which an impartial communication and um, an Im sorry, an impartial third party assists disputing parties in resolving conflicts through the use of specialized communication and negotiation techniques. If we focus on the relation to the media itself, one of the aspects uh, is the use of technologies. Technologies can be used as mediators between humans and the world. In the perspective, in this perspective, mediation theory is also called theory of uh, technological mediation. It offers a framework to analyze the roles technologies play in human existence and in society. One of the first ex uh, experts to propose technological mediation was Peter Paul Verbeek, a Dutch philosopher of technology at the University of Twente in the Netherlands in 2005. But whether it is by using social model or mediation theory, what I am interested in is the way we look at things differently. And this is also the way I look at articles. But one of the articles that triggered my attention and on which I tried to apply both theories was written by Blake Howe, who is here with us today. Thank you for being here. So I'm going to present you. <laughs> Blake Howe is an associate professor of musicology at Louisiana State University, not far from here, in fact. Uh, after Joseph Strauss wrote the first article about CDS and music uh, called Normalizing the Abnormal Disability in Music and Music Theory, published in 2006, Blake Howe followed, uh, proposing other aspects of uh, music and CDS, and he co-edited uh, the Oxford Handbook of Music and Disability Studies in 2016. We've, if we go back a little bit uh, in 2010, he wrote an article about Paul Wittgenstein and the problematic of 100 pianists called Paul Wittgenstein and the Performance of Disability, published in the Journal of Musicology. This is the article that triggered my attention. I looked at two aspects. What are the techniques used by the specific musician? And how was he perceived by the society? So first of all, who was Paul Wittgenstein? Uh, he was the brother of the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. He was an Austrian-American pianist who became famous before World War I, lost his, um, his right arm on the battlefield, and decided to persevere as a musician after the war. Thus, he developed strong technical skills with his left hand and became a 100 pianist label that we will discuss further. He commissioned numerous compositions uh, for left hand, including the famous Concerto pour la main gauche, composed by Maurice Ravel, and he transcribed many uh, compositions originally written for two hands to be able to perform it with his uh, left hand. Describing Wittgenstein's situation and state of mind when he came back from the war, uh, Howe refers to his sister, Margaret, who uh, thought the effort were, efforts were vain, saying that uh, his brother was trying to do what really cannot be done by insisting on playing the piano with one hand. Her words were strong. The mutilation and damage sustained by his brother were incompatible with the demands of a musical score, which requires the physical agility and dexterity of both arms and hands. How suggests that Margaret uses his disability and missing limb to redefine Paul's identity as a person and as a pianist. The pianist is defined as bodily capable experts. The whole body is living with the performance. The hands are running up and down the keyboard the arms are lifted to apply intense effects. 
that once his body was injured, the pianist lost his role as a pianist and became a one-handed pianist, as if it was a degraded classification. Could a one-handed pianist still be a professional musician? The audience attending uh, his concerts were motivated by mixed feelings of curiosity and misbelief in Wittgenstein's abilities. The journalists tried to normalize the situation in their reports. Uh, the concerts were always successful. The, the concert halls were always full. But they also, the journalists also reminded the military past of Wittgenstein like a war hero overcoming his battles. The notion of overcoming, it's, it, it, which is often criticized in critical disability studies, gives a heroic image uh, to individuals who don't intend to be represented as heroic. These individuals with disabilities are not heroes. They find ways to work with and around their disabilities, not despite their disabilities. Wittgenstein was no exception and was perfectly capable of playing with his left hand. Also, Wittgenstein's concerts were compared by the press and the audience in terms of disabled performance sounding non-disabled. These were, uh, so there was now a disabled sound and it, it didn't come from the sound itself, but from the fact that Wittgenstein had a visible disability. In CDS, there has always been a separation between the social model and the medical model of disability. We find the distinction in Wittgenstein's story here. Disabled against abled performer, 100 against 200 uh, pianist performer, disabled sound against able sound. The social model of disability examines how society defines, assumes, and understands disability, such as seeing a hero in a person with disability, but also the opposite, such as considering someone with a very visible impairment less capable than someone able-bodied. Can such experience lived by Wittgenstein still be lived today? Let's see. I will give you the case studies of three professional musicians I have interviewed between 2020 and 2022. These are uh, musicians living in three different parts of, of the world, in Europe and in America. They play three different instruments and their relation to music and to society at large is very contrasting. Let's start with Felix Kleiser. He's a German French horn player uh, born without arms, playing with uh, the horn with his feet. Uh, we can see his picture here. He has always known exactly what he wanted in his life. He started playing uh, the, the French horn at the age of four. He still doesn't know what pushed him to, uh, to ask his parents to enroll him in a class to learn uh, such an instrument so young, uh, especially since nobody in his family was um, particularly attracted to music or musician. But uh, he was sure of his choice. He told his music teachers that it would be the French horn or nothing else. So regarding his musical education, when I asked him where he started, he replied that it was in a, a normal uh, music school, like the ones in which everyone starts. The notion of normality seemed important to him. He said, because music teachers in Germany are not well paid, nobody is paying attention to the disability of a child. Uh, they take uh, any students to earn some extra salary. A statement I don't agree with. I was raised in France and in the Netherlands, so uh, neighbor countries of Germany, and this is not the experience I have. But let's say, let's say that it's due to geographical and cultural factors, right? For him, the only problem that he had, that he was forced uh, uh, very young to choose uh, an instrument that was easier for uh, a four years old uh, boy. But uh, he was categoric. He, he was talented from the very beginning. He won a national competition at the age of nine and, and more national competition at the age of 12. He uh, quickly acquired all the tools to become a professional musician. Interestingly, during the first part of the interview, he never mentioned his disability. 
Urdu, uh, he accepted to be interviewed as one of the most important Western art musicians with a disability uh, today recognized by the press as such. It was even more unexpected since he wrote in 2014 a book entitled, so I translate here, it's in German, I translate in English, Footnotes, A Hornist Without Arms Conquers the World. I asked him about his book which he claims was not his decision to write, but rather the editor who uh, thought it would be a good idea for him uh, to write despite his young age and despite the fact that he was starting his musical uh, professional career. Now, he was still the one who wrote the book, right? <laughs> this led to a conversation about his way of performing, uh, performing with his feet. We also talked about public representation, like many musicians, uh, showing their activities. He frequently posts pictures on social media. Everybody in Europe knows him as uh, the musician who plays uh, with no arms. Uh, he wrote this book about his career as a hornet without feet, and he appears in many uh, press articles in Europe, always featuring him uh, under a title mentioning his disability. Yet in our interview, uh, the notion of disability was almost completely absent. So when I interview someone, uh, I don't particularly push uh, to talk about disability. It, it should be about music, and not for, so that my aim is to uh, interview them about their musical career when I interview someone. But uh, all the musicians I have interviewed so far, even those who clearly st uh, stated that music talk was more important than a disability talk to them, uh, didn't refrain from talking about the topic. So this was um, my first interview of a musician with disability uh, avoiding the conversation. And this raised a few questions for me in terms of social model of disability. In this scenario, the musician doesn't want to be associated with the disability model because of the association with disability itself. So let's move to another musician. Galen Lee is a well-known figure in disability activism. She's an American violinist and singer. She was born and uh, grew up with bent arms and legs, and she uses an electric wheelchair since early childhood. We see her picture here. In fifth grade, she became interested in the school orchestra, and she passed the listening tests with a perfect score, which intrigued the teacher enough to let her join the orchestra. The teacher suggested that she starts with a cello but the instrument was too big for her to uh, use in a conventional way. Uh, she then switched to the violin. And with the help of her teacher, she developed a technique of playing her instruments that still applies today. She holds the violin upright as if uh, she was holding a cello, and then she holds the, the bow, which is a, a half size smaller than a traditional bow, uh, like a double bass player. She's also a singer, and in 2016, she entered the American Radio NPR's Tiny Desk Contest, and she won. And she started a musical tour. And during her tour, she embraced the concept of disability pride, which consists of seeing disability as an ordinary component uh, of our society and of our identity, of which one should be proud. She became a public speaker, building awareness on uh, what being disabled means and how details such as the language used to talk about uh, disability can make a difference. She defends the fact that living with an able body is not better than living with a different kind of body. All these, of, uh, all these notions uh, we can find in the social model of disability. Recently, she collaborated with the American singer Lachi both believe that disability awareness talks are uh, helpful, but could be complemented uh, with something more significant. And in uh, 2021, Lee participated in a Grammy disability panel moderated by Lachi, after which the Recording Academy told Lachi that they would come back to them. Okay, there was no them. <laughs> the participants invited were individual musicians, and Lachi and Lee realized that what was needed was an organization. So um, they created a coalition of music professionals called RAMPT, Recording Artists and Music Professionals with Disabilities. And I'm sure you're gonna hear more about that soon, of which Lachi is the president and Lee the vice president. The organization was launched in January, 2022, so it's fresh. 
Their aim is to amplify disability culture, promote inclusion, and advocate for accessibility within the music industry. For the two performers, creating a cohort of music professionals with all kinds of disabilities uh, gives a stronger public representation and presence to all disabled musicians. The last case study uses mediation theory a bit more than uh, the two previous cases. This time it's about technology itself in uh, the sense of new technologies and the way the use of such technology is perceived in relation to uh, music and disability. In 2015, 15 musicians were invited to test the prot prototype of gloves that could control musical patterns. These, call, these gloves are called the Mimu gloves. And um, so Imogen Heap initiated the project and recruited 15 testers, among which Chris Halpin, a British guitarist with cerebral palsy who lost some of his mobility. And when he was contacted to be part of the 15 musicians to test the Mimu gloves, he didn't know it would change his way of performing music forever. Today, the Mimu gloves are his instruments. These are connected gloves. The sensors of the, of, on the gloves are connected to a computer. It converts uh, movements to musical patterns. So instructions such as play this instrument or give me this drum with this rhythm or repeat this excerpt in a loop, something like that, are associated with movements producing music. Uh, with, the, with the form of uh, new technology instruments, uh, the perception of disability changes. Since it is a computer, and since the computer makes no judgment on the person uh, sending the signals patterns to a machine, right? There is no difference between a disabled and a non-disabled performer. The idea that disability is preventing from creating music or is seen as negative, is associated to sad thoughts or whatever, has disappeared. The shift from enabled to abled is exactly what the social model of disability in CDS defends today. And in this case, with the use of new technology and with the help of new technologies. Almost a century separates Paul Wittgenstein and uh, Chris Halpin's experiences. In terms of disability representation and acceptance in our society, improvements are undeniable. The two other cases also illustrate uh, these changes, but in reality, much more remains to be done. So as a conclusion, let's go back to the Power Orchestra's mission reinvent the orchestra of the 21st century. Although the social model of uh, the social model or mediation theory could be applied to the musical journeys of uh, the, by, followed by these three musicians, the way disabled musicians perceive their own music is too different um, to follow one single framework or to reimagine one orchestra of the 21st century. We have seen that some of the musicians reject the notion of disability in their music, and some of them embrace it and transform it to propose a new creative vision of disability in music. Despite the gap of uh, one century, Wittgenstein's perception of his role as a musician is similar to the cases of the three musicians we have explored together. Wittgenstein wanted to place musicianship before disability like Felix Kleiser today. Wittgenstein wanted to show that uh, a differently able body was not preventing from performing like Galen Lee did to the, uh, showed us today. And Wittgenstein commissioned works that he could perform with his one hand and Chris Halping creates music that he can perform with his own movements. So at the end, each body is different and each individual and each personality is different. To borrow the musicologist Christopher Small's term, there are many ways of musicking. And I will add that there are many ways of living disability through music. And here are lots of references I can send by email to whoever is interested. And thank you very much. Feel free to step up. We have, we have just a moment or two for questions. If, if, I, if I may uh, answer this, the microphone on from Andrew Bellantoni, who has been here so we will talk more about it. Um, I'm struck by a couple of things. One is, um, well, actually, I, I, I guess the question is the column. Um, your hornist, uh, does he make any reference to, to class talk? 
also a German person born with a non standard body and who minimized her disability. And connect to that is do you think there's any difference between the Anglo world notion of disability pride and what I believe is a less of that presence of disability pride in, say, Germany and maybe even France? So yeah. Could you speak to that? Yes, very good point. Thank you for that question. Uh, yes, in fact, it's true. And I was talking about geographical factors, and this is really the case. So from my point of view as a French person to his point of view as a German person, it might be true that it's totally different. Uh, now, um, about the other hornist, I have to admit I don't know him. Oh, he's, he's a, oh, 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 yes, sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, so, uh, but it's very, very different because uh, Kostov doesn't, doesn't uh, reject disability. He's talking about it in a different way. He is really, um, so he's really, he's really not mentioning it. He's avoiding the conversation completely. Kostov cannot, uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> he cannot. So every time he is, he is interviewed, he has been asked. He, he's, he says in his press articles, there are so many press articles. He starts by saying, everybody has a different story. Let's talk about the story of music. And then he avoids completely disability. So there is a, it's an interesting way of talking. And I think it should be really considered as uh, one of the counter model of a social model, but also included because, you know, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> I hope uh, I replied. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think that a lot of the presenters you have here are very much like pointing to this, like the idea you talked about of overcoming and like this exceptionalism, which in itself is a very infantilizing kind of thing. So I'm, I just kind of be curious to hear maybe talk a little bit about how we might use different frameworks or reimagine how we can talk about amateurism in uh, music making with um, disability. Very good question. Thank you. So this is a very important point, uh, overcoming. Most of the people I talk to uh, when we are mentioning uh, professional musicians are saying, oh, I'm such in an admiration for this person because, oh, yeah, he can make music. And I say, did you consider that this person just wanted to make music? That's all. It's just that... Oh, it's, it's a hero because he, he found a way to make music. But we, as a musician, we all have to, if we want to perform, we have to find a way. So that's the case for Felix Kieser. If he wanted to perform, he had to perform with his feet. If you want to drive a car and you have no arms, you drive it with the feet. Uh, and, you know, it's like, okay, this wheelchair is my shoes because if I, that allows me to walk. But it's, 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 it's to shift the idea that, um, and this is social model of disability. This is really framework, the, the, a, a set of frameworks where you can find uh, the difference between the medical and the, and, um, and the social, but you can find also a lot of different frameworks. So I recommend you uh, read um, some of the works that are right now in critical disability studies to, to help you on that. Thank you so much. Thank you.